So if you, if you can remember uh, last time, these days I'm not going to have a cold. So if you remember last time, we talked about how there was this debate about the existence of other galaxies. And this realization that the Milky Way was just one among lots of other galaxies in the universe. So this debate and the was sort of over around the beginning of the 20th century. And that's when it was kind of coming to a head. But before that time, uh, astronomers had noted that there were other things up there in the night sky that were not either planets or stars. And these, are, these were generally just called nebulae. Um, for, they just didn't know what else to call them, sort of this other classification of things that were called nebulae, the sort of blurry, patchy things in the sky. Um, a very famous catalog of these nebulae was put together by a guy named Charles Messier, um, who eventually compiled a list of sort of a hundred or so fuzzy objects in the sky. Um, and what he was really doing is he was trying to chart the sky for things that were new. He was trying to discover like a comet. Because back in those days, if you discovered a comet, that's how you made your name for yourself, right? If you like, you like you a comet, and that would be really cool. So that was one of the reasons he was charting the sky. Um, but basically, as this catalog of almost every bright, interesting, non-stellar object in the northern sky that you can see from France, where it was, um, that he compiled. And today, actually, one of the things that's interesting about astronomers is they, they like to hang on to the history. So we still call a lot of objects, we name them after Messier objects. So they're still called Messier objects. And, so for, and what we do is we call them M number for shorthand. So Messi had a catalog of something, 103 year objects or something. And that's called like M1, M2, M3, all the way up to M3. Um, so here's an example of one of his objects. This is M42, the 42nd of the nebulae that he described. And this is called the Orion Nebula. Um, we now know what the Orion Nebula is. Um, he didn't really know what it was. But it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cloudy mass of stuff that's surrounding a bunch of new stars being born in the Milky Way. So it's really not very far away from us in the scheme of things. It's about 1,300 light years away. Remember, the galaxy is 100,000 light years across, so it's actually fairly nearby the sun on the scale. So it's sort of in our neighborhood. And it's this very beautiful object. Um, it's got multicolored. And it's glowing red and blue and green. And the red that you see here is light that's being emitted by heated up hydrogen. So when you heat up hydrogen, it has an emission line. So when, it, when, the, when that electron falls back down, it has a specific emission line that's called H-alpha that emits light that's red. So this light that you see that's glowing red is coming from hot hydrogen. And hydrogen is being heated up by young stars that are spitting out a lot of energy, heating up the gas around them, and that gas is going red. You also see blue light, and a lot of this blue light is focused around what look like stars, and that's what these are. These are four, see that one there? There are young stars that are emitting that are glowing blue. So it turns out young stars glow blue. The hotter you are, the more likely you are to glow blue, and cooler stars glow red. Remember because of Wien's Law and black body radiation? So these young stars that were recently born, turns out that young stars tend to, well, because massive stars tend to be uh, very hot, they tend to glow blue. And that's what we're seeing here. Young, massive stars glowing blue. Um, here's another Messier object that we now have a much better picture of. This is called M82. It's the 82nd, 82nd object from his catalog. Um, this galaxy is about 12 million light years away. So remember, the Milky Way is 100,000 light years across. Okay, So this is 120 times as far away from the galaxy as the galaxy is big. Okay, So if, if the galaxy is this big, it's sort of across the room. So it's, it's pretty nearby as galaxies go. And you can see, and you can see a lot better on the lectures if you download them, if people have them on their laptop. There's a disk of stars right here. There's a lot of dust. That's what this dark stuff is. And then there are these red 
cloudy, almost looking flames looking things that are kind of coming out of either end of the disk. Those are clouds of hydrogen that are being blown out of the galaxy because this galaxy is experiencing a whole lot of star formation in its center, something like 10 times as much as is going on in the Milky Way right now. So a lot of stars are being born and in association with those new stars being born, they're spinning out a lot of energy and this energy is blowing gas out, almost like a chimney out either side. Jets of gas are, are coming out either side of the galaxy. So anyway, these are just two of Messier's objects that he was studying. But of course, at the time, he didn't know what they were. He, couldn't, he didn't have an image that was nearly this good. He didn't know how far away it was. All he knew was sort of a nebulous thing in the sky that was, that was blurry. And so by the early 20th century, thousands of these nebulae had been compiled by astronomers here and there. And uh, some of them, they thought they knew what they were because you could associate stars with them. So it looked like they were just gas clouds around stars and the stars were lighting them up. Kind of like Orion, the Orion Nebula that I showed you before. This is another image of Orion here. Um, <coughs> many of them didn't look like that. And in fact, they looked much more regular. And they almost looked like they had spiral patterns in them. These are called spiral nebulae. And one of the topics of this Curtis Shapley debate was to argue about what these spiral nebulae were. Were are they inside the galaxy or are they actually external galaxies, island universes in their own right? Are there any questions about that? Sure. Well, the last thing I said. Yeah. So, this Curtis Shapley debate that I talked about last time was was a debate between Curtis and Shapley about the nature of the galaxy and whether there were other galaxies in the universe. And one of the things they wanted they were debating at the time was whether or not these spiral nebulae were actually other galaxies, or whether they were inside of our own galaxy and they were just, they just happened to be shaped like spirals and they were new Okay? <coughs> so, about this time, early 20th century, um, there was this person named George Ellery Hale, who was the director of an observatory on the summit of Mount Wilson. Okay, and Mount Wilson is in Southern California. It's just north of Los Angeles. Has anyone ever been to Mount Wilson, I wonder? Okay, only one, only two. You should try to go to Mount Wilson, it's pretty cool. Um, but anyway, this is a pic, this is what, oh, so let me back up. So, Hale wanted to build a big telescope, a really big telescope, because he, figure that if the bigger the telescope you have, the more likely it is you will be able to really resolve what's going on in these spiral nebulae. And you can answer the question, what is the nature of the universe that we live in? Is the universe just one big galaxy with a, with a bunch of stars in it? Or is the universe composed of many, many galaxies that sort of go on? And are these how far away are these nebulae that we see in the sky? And he understood that in order to do that, you would need a really big telescope. The bigger telescope you had, the more resolving power you could have, you would be able to resolve individual stars, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So eventually, he was able to build this telescope, which had a hundred-inch diameter mirror, which at the time would have been by far the biggest telescope in the world. And you would need a telescope this big to solve this nebula problem. Now Hale was um, an astronomer who understood that there were a lot of people in the general public who were interested in these fundamental questions about what the universe was like. And he eventually convinced a very rich donor, a friend of his, a local businessman named John Hooker, who also lived in Los Angeles, to give him the equivalent of tens of millions of dollars uh, in today's money to help him build this telescope. Now, uh, so eventually, to build this telescope, it took 11 years and they built this, this disk of glass that they had to cast. It was 100 inches in diameter. It had to be perfectly cast. Because you're basically making a lens out of it. Right? <laughs> Remember, the year is like 1910. Um, and uh, it was four and a half tons of, of glass. And eventually it was installed around 1917. So they had to get this huge two and a half ton piece of glass up to the top of the mountain. Right. In 
1910. So basically they were using mules and old-timey trucks, like the first trucks that people had. They used them to try to get up this giant mountain. If you've ever been up to Mount Wilson, like even today, getting up Mount Wilson is easy. Okay. And they eventually installed it, and if you go up to Mount Wilson today, this is what the telescope looks like. You can go in there and see. Okay. So then, about a year later, they hired a new astronomer to come and work at the observatory. And it was to great big fanfare, by the way, when they were building this telescope. This was a big deal sort of in the news. This was a big deal national news, like that Americans were going to be able to build this ridiculous telescope. I mean, at the time, this was just insanely big. Okay. So it's worth visiting this place. It's up here. So here's Pasadena. Here's Burbank. It's up here. This is a view from Mount Wilson at night now, so you can go up there. It's pretty neat. It's one of the most important things in the history of astronomy, and it's right up there, and it's easy to go see. I think it's free. Um, so this guy, Edwin Hubble, uh, they hired this guy, Edwin Hubble. Uh, Edwin Hubble was a pretty interesting fellow. Uh, he ended up joining Mount Wilson's staff in 1919 on work for Hale. And uh, he had previously studied math and astronomy at the University of Chicago. Turns out he was also a jock. Like, he ran track. He was a basketball player. He played for the University of Chicago basketball team, which was good at the time. Uh, and he was also, he was offered to train for the World Heavyweight Championship in boxing. Apparently he was a great boxer. He turned down that offer to accept the Rhodes Scholarship at Oxford. Poor guy. <laughs> Not very accomplished, is he? Um, so anyway, he's sort of this interesting guy. He's done all kinds of things. Um, and he was hired, and around 1919, he started using this giant telescope, the largest telescope in the world, to observe these distant nebulae and try to figure out what they were. He was convinced that they were other galaxies, but he needed data to show that if you could resolve individual stars in, say, the nearest big nebula, which is Andromeda, he could show that this was actually a galaxy in its own right. What he was able to do is eventually resolve a certain type of star. There are these certain types of stars called Cepheid variable stars that I talked about last time. These things are about a thousand times as bright as the sun. So you can see them from very far away. And they also pulsate, and the period of their pulsation correlates with how intrinsically bright they are, so you can figure out how far away they are. Nevertheless, he was able to do this and figure out that Andromeda, this what we call another, another Messier object called M31, which we call the Andromeda galaxy as well, um, is a galaxy in its own right. Um, Hubble was an interesting character, too, by the way, because he spent like two years at Oxford, and then for the rest of his life, he basically pretended like he had a British accent. <laughs> he talked about the British accent for like the rest of his life. So a lot of people didn't like him. Anyway, he got a telescope named after him. And so this is the Andromeda galaxy that, that Hubble was studying. And we now know that M31, this Messier object that Messier had seen in the sky, you know, in the 1700s, is another galaxy in its own right, because Hubble was able to use the largest telescope in the world to resolve individual stars in this galaxy, which now I can show you this great picture of. You can do this routinely. Um, so this is M31. It's a galaxy. Uh, we think that the Milky Way is a lot like M31. Now, with this realization, there's a fundamental change in, in how humanity begins to see itself in the universe. Okay. These are the kind of fundamental changes that Hooker was interested in investing his vast fortune in doing. Okay. Uh, once you realize that all of these other spiral nebulae out there are actually other galaxies in their own right, the universe becomes even bigger than we thought it was before. So even though at the time we realized that all these stars in the sky were distant suns, and we had some sense that the galaxy was very big compared to the size of the solar system, suddenly now you come to grips with the fact that there are other galaxies out there that are very, very, very far away. So the Earth is just one planet around a single star, which is just one among 100 billion stars in the galaxy which we now know is something like one among 100 billion or so galaxies in the universe. 
<laughs> when you look at this picture of uh, M31 of Andromeda, you see that there's other things going on. It's not just a, a ball of stars, but you see there's sort of structure here. So one of the things that you notice is that there's this other kind of bright ball of stars there and another one there. These are other little galaxies. So these are little satellite galaxies that are orbiting around the big galaxy Andromeda. <coughs> this one's called M32. Again, also named after Messier. So he could see it. He just didn't know what it was. This one, again, is M31. And this one is not named after Messier. It's named after another catalog. So it's called NGC 205, and NGC is just the name of that catalog. Doesn't matter. The other thing you'll notice when you look at Andromeda itself is that the inner part is kind of yellowish red, and the outer part is kind of blue. So why is that? Well, if you remember the color, the color that things glow tells you something about how hot they are. Okay. So according to Wien's law, the hotter the temperature of an object, the more it will glow at shorter wavelengths. What that means, it's bluer, so more towards bluer light. So massive stars are very, very hot, and they glow blue. Also, the thing about massive stars is they don't live very long. The most massive stars, the ones that burn the hottest, die the quickest. They burn out of their fuel the quickest. And so if you see blue light in a galaxy, you see a lot of blue light glowing out of a galaxy from the galaxy's stars, you know that that galaxy has formed stars fairly recently, or else it wouldn't have any massive stars because they'd all be gone. If instead you see mostly red light glowing from the galaxy, that means that um, most of the stars are pretty old because all the young stars have burned out. And the only ones left are the ones that are cooler, that live longer, and those glow red. Question about that? So another way to say it is if you remember this diagram that I been showing you before. This is the luminosity of stars, which correlates with how massive they are. And this is the temperature of the star along this axis. As you go towards more massive stars, they tend to have higher temperatures and therefore glow bluer. And then these stars down here glow red. So these red stars, they live a long time. So the lifetimes of these stars are like 10 billion years. The lifetimes of these stars up here in the corner are much less than that, like 10 billion years. You see a lot of blue stars, that means those stars have only been around at most 10 million years. But if you only see these old red, you only see red stars, that means any young, any stars that were very massive are already gone. So that means that galaxy has been around a long time. Or that group of stars has been around a long time. Any questions about that? Yeah. Yeah, so, okay, so massive stars um, are very good at turning their hydrogen into helium and begin, and, and so they basically burn up their energy, very, they burn up their fuel really fast. So they're, in some sense, they're very efficient in just burning that fuel off and then it's gone and they're over, it's over. Where the old stars, the low mass stars, it, they are more stable, it takes them longer to burn up their fuel. So they live for very, very long times. Um, if you want to be a planet, if you were a planet and you want to evolve life around a star, you want to be around an old, a, a low mass star. This thing's going to give you tens of billions of years to hang around and evolve. If you're around a low mass, a high mass star, that star is only going to be around 10 million years anyway. It's not that much time. It's probably not going to evolve life. So anyway. What, that's from that fact that you understand from studying stars that are local to us within the galaxy, you can take a look at another galaxy and you see, look at all this red light in the middle and all this blue light in the outer star. This suggests that the inner part of this galaxy is old and the outer part is young, which suggests that the inner part formed first and the outer part formed later. So they sort of form from the inside out. Does that make sense? And we can deduce that. I mean, if you think about it for a second, it's kind of remarkable. Here's this thing, this galaxy. It's not even our galaxy. It's two and a half million light years away. 
And we can look at a picture of it, and I can tell you how it formed. I can tell you, well, this part of the galaxy was built first, and then this part was built after that. And I can do that because I understand black body radiation. And I also have studied a lot of stars in my own galaxy. And I assume that the stars in this galaxy act the same as the stars in my galaxy. Does that make sense? Are there any questions? Okay. So this is what I'm talking about. This is the Milky Way, and this is Andromeda. And it's about two and a half million light years away. Both Andromeda and our galaxy have, going around them, little satellite galaxies. And you can see them kind of enumerated here. Here's M32, the same one I talked about in NGC 205. These are the Magellanic Clouds. You can remember those clouds. They're sort of cloudy things in the sky that you can see from the Southern Hemisphere that are named after Magellan because Magellan used them to navigate. Those are satellite galaxies of, of the Milky Way that are going around it. So it's like we have these little galaxies going around us, and there's other little galaxies going around Andromeda. But we're the two big ones on the block. We're the two big galaxies on the block. And it turns out that we're headed towards each other. And we think that in about 4 billion years, we're going to collide with Andromeda. And when that happens, we're going to be one big galaxy. It'll be kind of interesting. Sorry? Yeah, and I'll talk about that. So, and there are other, on, we see other pictures of, we see images of galaxies in the universe that look like they're colliding right now, which are really dramatic. It's really fun. Um, so, yeah. Now, it turns out that even though this is two and a half million light years, um, that's not, well, let me emphasize how amazing that is, right? So when, I look, when you look at this picture, this is what Andromeda looked like two and a half million years ago. This is not what it looks like now. If you want to know what it looks like now, we've got to wait two and a half million years. Okay. Now, in the scheme of things, two and a half million years isn't really that long, because even the youngest, even the stars that, that live the shortest amounts of time live 10 million years. So whatever it looked like two and a half million years ago is probably what it looks like now, too. So it's not that big of a deal. But nevertheless, it's still kind of fascinating that the photons from this galaxy have been traveling uninterrupted for two and a half million years before they hit the prime focus of whatever telescope took this image. So the light's been traveling longer than there have been humans on Earth. But interestingly, in the scheme of things, this distance, or this amount of time, is nothing. So one of the most distant galaxies, or, so, so let, me, let me back up. So, uh, so this is what Andromeda looked like two and a half million years ago. One of the most distant galaxies that Hubble Space Telescope has imaged is shown here. There are actually more distant ones, but this is just an example. Um, the light from this galaxy left it 12 billion years ago and then traveled for 12 billion years before it hit the Hubble Space Telescope's prime focus. <coughs> so the light from this galaxy left it before the sun existed. Now, in the scheme of things also, 12 billion years is a lot of time, even for stars. So there's a lot of difference between what stars look like you know, 5 billion years ago, then we'll like now, and certainly 10 billion years ago, it's, or 12 billion years ago, it's a big deal. And the other thing is this galaxy and the galaxies that we study at these very, very early times, at the farthest distances, don't really look like the galaxies we see locally, it turns out. They haven't quite developed this rich spiral structure that we see locally. And... Um, it's really evidence, it's empirical evidence that the universe was different in the past than it is now. And what's, what's interesting about this, and I'll talk more about this later, is you can use the fact that light takes a finite amount of time to get to us as a way of sort of constructing a movie and looking into the past. So when we look at lots of galaxies that are very, very far away, we see a sample of the universe as it was a very long time ago. 
And then we look at galaxies that are closer, we see a sample of the universe as they were, as it was not as long ago. And then the very nearby galaxies is what the universe looks like today. So from that, you can effectively build a movie of how the universe grew over time. And remarkably, you can see changes. You can see that the universe, in fact, was a different place. Galaxies had different characteristics at early times than they do now. <coughs> so this is sort of another image of what the Milky Way and Andromeda look like. And this is called the local group. I think I mentioned this before. That our, our little group of Andromeda and the Milky Way and the other little galaxies around us is called the local group. And this yardstick up here is about 100 million light, uh, sorry, 1 million light years across. Every dot on this paper is a galaxy in its own right. And the biggest ones have 100 billion stars in them. Now we can zoom out by a factor of 10 because we're able to make maps of galaxies now that go out to very large distances. Now this is now the yardstick is 10 million light years across. And here's the local group. Every single dot here is a bright galaxy like the Milky Way. And you see that there's this other place over here that has lots and lots of dots. That's called the Virgo cluster of galaxies. There's a lot of galaxies that live all around each other that are sort of swarming around each other like a, like a bunch of bees in a hive. And this is a cluster of galaxies. And the other thing you can see is that this is not a random distribution of points that are just smeared out evenly here. The galaxies like to live in groups and they cluster in interesting ways. And we see that they, you know, they... <laughs> gravity basically is allowing them to cluster together in ways that's, you know, it's not just a random sprinkling of galaxies in the universe, they're actually structured together. There is very large scale structure in the universe. We can zoom out by another factor of 10. So now this is 100 million light years. The local group is sitting right at the center here. Again, every one of these dots is a galaxy in its own right. And it just keeps going after this. One thing you'll notice is that galaxies like to live in clusters, but also in these kind of filamentary lines. They're sort of filaments of galaxies that populate almost cigar-shaped distribution. <laughs> and those, those distributions kind of come together and make very bright, very big galaxy clusters there. Now there are names here associated with these. The, the only thing that are named anymore here are, are galaxy clusters. You know, we stop naming every single galaxy because there's just so many of them that you don't really want to name them all. You can't. But what instead is done here is they're naming clusters of galaxies, and the clusters typically are named after the constellation you have to look through to see them. So again, remind yourself, we're sitting in a disk of stars. There are a few stars in our way that we have to look through, look out, to see the distant galaxies that lie very far away from us. So, you know, the, the Coma Cluster is named the Coma Cluster because all of those galaxies lie in the, in the direction of the sky that we have to look through the Coma Constellation to see it. Other questions about that? Yeah. Yeah, the void is just a place where, for one reason or another, galaxy, I mean, galaxies have not formed there. So there are these huge, empty regions in the universe where there basically aren't very many galaxies. So there's a void, a void there, and a void there. <laughs> So this was kind of a, these are kind of artist representations of data. This is more, this is an image of real data. So every point here on this plot is a galaxy. And it's shaped like a pie wedge because basically the, you've had a telescope and the telescope has gone like this in the sky and seen all galaxies in that direction out very far distance and then sort of done this. And that creates a wedge-like shape. So you see a wedge out here. The edge of this arrow is something like 2 billion light years away. Okay? This survey is called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. It was sponsored by the Sloan Foundation, or the Sloan Foundation. Um, this is one of the biggest continuous maps of the universe that's ever been made. Um, 
It was a telescope that was dedicated for doing nothing but this for a couple of years. All the telescope did was point at the sky and just make a huge map of the universe. Um, and it's just many, many terabytes of data. This used to be a really impressive number. Now no one's impressed by 15 terabytes of data. But several years ago, this was an impressive number. Wow, it's bigger than the Library of Congress. Google's way big, way, way bigger than that. But anyway. Uh, and the thing to keep in mind is when you look, oh, it came off the, anyway. When you look at these dots, every single one of these dots is a galaxy that has structure in it, like this. Every single one of them. So the million galaxies that are plotted in this figure, every single one of them is this complex. It has sort of like 100 billion stars with its own spiral structure. Some of them look different. They all are individual. They look different. So there's this huge distribution of galaxies. Every one of them has this interesting structure. In principle, they can host you know, lots and lots of planets and stars and things like that in their own right. The questions about this? Yeah? Why is it, um, like, I guess, brighter? Why is it brighter down yeah. here than here? Yeah. Yeah. There's a couple things going on. It's easier to, for us to find more galaxies that are nearby. In order to see the galaxies that are farther away, they have to be brighter. Okay. So we don't see as many. That's a very good question. Very, very good question. Um, so these galaxies out here just are brighter, and they're not, but they're not as many of them. So what's shown here is sort of a density map, but we just can't see all of the galaxies out here that we can see that are closer by. So that's part of it. Um, that's, that's most of it, really. Now, the other thing that you would begin to see, and you can, begin, you can sort of begin to see it here, is that even taking into account that, the universe has a lot more structure to it near us than it does far away from us. Because we're actually looking back in time some two billion years to to see these galaxies. And it turns out the universe just was not as structured two billion years ago as it is now. Because the universe grows with time. The structure gets more and more complex with time. Gravity is making things more dense and is dragging galaxies together. So galaxies are more clustered together today than they were two billion years ago or four billion years ago or eight billion years ago. And with maps like this that look out this far, we can actually begin to observe that. And one thing we'll learn about later on is that we think if we go all the way back to the beginning, the universe was effectively perfectly smooth, it was almost perfectly smooth, and there was no structure at all. And from this very smooth beginning, eventually grew all the structure that we see today. And so as you look back and back and back, you see less and less and less structure. <coughs> so, uh, question? Is all the structure due to gravity? Yes, it's all due to gravity. Yeah? Uh, I, just, I guess I'm so kind of seems like contradictory from like our other lecture of like how everything's like expanding and moving away from each yeah. other, but it's still like Yeah. It is a little bit. Um so globally the universe is moving and I haven't I'll, I'll talk about all this stuff in context in the next lecture when I put all this stuff together. But so globally the universe is expanding. Right? This is a great question. Thanks for asking this. So globally the universe is expanding. But locally, it's not. So the Milky Way and Andromeda are headed towards each other. So they are not expanding away from each other. But the Milky Way and Andromeda are expanding away from some more distant galaxies that might also be moving towards each other. So what you end up happening is you have these pockets or regions of the universe that are flowing towards each other. And then those as a whole are moving as bulk. So that's a way. Kind of the cigar shaped like. Yeah, sort of. That's right, sort of, exactly. Yeah, that's, that's a good way to think about it. So there's like regions that collapse and then everything else is expanding. So it's, it's actually a quite complicated thing that's going on. Things are both expanding, but then locally they're collapsing. Um, and remarkably, the thing is, we can actually model this and we know how to like, if we put all the laws of physics into supercomputers and model this, we can actually reproduce the structure we see in, in this kind of but it's, yeah, it's, yeah. So eventually, if like, things, like, start coming together, is that the that the universe is going to come into a It might, so. So it's 
So the, answer, the, the correct answer is no, we don't think that's going to happen. But the way you're thinking about things is exactly the more you about whether you think it's eventually going to recollapse or not. And I'll, I'm going to dedicate lectures to that idea in a couple lectures from now. But the way you're thinking is exactly right. And this, was, this is the line of reasoning that people were investigating 20 years ago. I can give you an answer just because people have been working on this problem for a while, and, and the answer turns out to be no. We don't think the universe is going to recollapse. So, let me back up. Now, remember when Hubble... So, Hubble didn't know all of this. Hubble had only detected that there were... He basically had only mapped out the local region, because even though he had the biggest telescope at the time, it's nowhere nearly, it's nowhere, it's nearly as big as the telescopes we have today. Okay? And so, he knew some of this. He didn't know all of this. And when he was first studying galaxies, he didn't even know that the universe was expanding. He would eventually discover that. But one of the things he was trying to do was just categorize these galaxies. Now he knew that there were other objects in their own right, and he wanted to categorize them and just sort of make some sense of all of this, because the universe is made up of all these different types of galaxies. And it turns out that among these nebulae that we think are actually other galaxies in their own right, there are basically two types. There are those that look like big balls of stars, and there are others that look like disks of stars. The ones that are sort of big balls of stars that are very featureless, we call elliptical galaxies. And the ones that have a lot more structure, specifically the spiral structure, and we think live in our disks, we call spiral galaxies. And the first person to um, derive a classification system for galaxies was Hubble. Um, and we now classify galaxies by what we call Hubble types. Um, and you can basically say from one type of galaxy to the next, it goes from very big, big round, featureless galaxies that are elliptical galaxies, and there's subclasses of ellipticals, but I'm not going to test you on any of this stuff. Um, and then among spiral galaxies, there's basically two types of spirals that are those that have bars, these bar-like structures in the middle, and there are those that don't. Um, and I'm not going to test you about any of the details. The only thing I'm going to ask you to know is that there are spirals and there are ellipticals. But there's, there are differences between the types, and one of the things that astronomers try to do is figure out why there are different types and how they came to be. Um, there are two things that I would like you to know about the, <coughs> these different types of galaxies. Um, the elliptical galaxies... Are, tend to be made of older stars. They tend to be red and very old, like they've been around for a long time. Spiral galaxies tend to be younger. They tend to have more blue light, have younger stars. And it's sort of the more recent stars that are formed in the universe we think formed in spirals. The ellipticals are basically old, and they've been around a very, very long time. I'm not going to test you on details of the Hubble sequence. I'm just throwing it up here for informational purposes. But basically, there are elliptical galaxies and there are spiral galaxies. The Milky Way is a spiral galaxy. It's a disk. The elliptical galaxies, um, again, are basically just big balls of stars. Those stars tend to be old and red. And these galaxies tend to be pretty featureless. The spiral galaxies are more interesting because they're flattened structures. They tend to have spiral structure in them. Um, and uh, they're like the Milky Way and Andromeda. Now, I'll just show you some pictures so you know what I'm talking about. This is a spiral galaxy, seen edge on. They tend to have round bits in the middle called bulges, and they have disks. Most of their stars are in disks, and most of the stars are forming in the disks. This is um, a sort of a transitional object that's halfway between an elliptical and a spiral. Its technical name is an S0. You guys don't have to know that. But there are, there are systems that look like they have big disks, but they also have big round parts, too. So they're sort of half spiral and half disk. This is an example of a barred spiral, which basically just has a gigantic bar and a structure like this. This is very, very blue. There's lots of stars forming in this region of, the, of this galaxy. So just to classify things, to lay this out for you, spirals tend to have 10 to 100 billion stars. 
They tend to have a disk and a central region that we call a bulge, a round part. They tend to have formed their stars more recently, so they're bluer. Um, these younger stars, like I said, makes more blue light because they're short-lived and they're massive. So this ma they have all these massive stars that glow very hot, therefore they're blue, um, and that's why you see spirals tend to be blue. The elliptical galaxies tend to be larger. The largest galaxies in the universe are elliptical galaxies. They can have more than 100 billion stars, sometimes 200 billion, 300 billion, 400 billion. There are some monster elliptical galaxies out there. Um, and they tend to have older stars in them. So they tend to be red, and they look like they've been around a lot longer than most spirals. <coughs> so one of the things, yeah. For the spiral, what creates the bulge? That is a topic of current research. Um, I will, okay, so one of the things we think happen in the universe, so there's all these different types of stuff. I'll use this to answer your question. One of the things that we think happen in the universe all the time, our galaxies should collide. And like I mentioned to you, the Milky Way and Andromeda are headed towards each other. And you can imagine that when two disks of stars collide, the result is not going to be as clean as two disks. And what we think happens is, and these are pictures of real galaxies here, they're not the same galaxy, but we see galaxies that look like this in the universe, and we actually see pairs of galaxies that look like they're interacting in the universe. And we see big, round-looking, spheroidal things in the universe. So there is an idea that there is this sequence of most galaxies start off as spirals, they collide together, and after the collision, they have a big round bit. There's another idea that after that, they can then accrete more matter, which comes on as a disk, that grows after that. So you can have a big bulge left over from the last merger, which is old, and then you have new disks that grow on top of them. So that's the idea, and so that may be where the bulge comes from. Um, so this is just a movie, a numerical simulation that was done a little while ago of what happens when galaxies collide. And you see it looks a lot like these pictures of real galaxies that we see in the universe at various stages. So there's M31 and the Milky Way coming together sometime four billion years from now. And you see that gravity brings them together. They also have these big tails of material that get thrown out. Those are called tidal tails. Um, and we think this kind of thing happens quite often. It's not that surprising that galaxies collide because, first of all, galaxies, as I showed you in maps, tend to cluster together. And they're just not that far away from each other. Like the Milky Way and Andromeda are like this far away. And they're both attracting each other by gravity. So they're pulling towards each other all the time. So it's not that surprising that they collapse, that they merge. Yeah? The collision, is it pretty fast? Like, let's, say it happened, let's say it happened now. Yeah. Here, yeah. Would it be, would we, would we be blind? No, so you wouldn't know it. So this takes a billion years. Or at the very shortest time would be a few hundred million years to complete. So you would never live, you would never sort of watch this. So one of the things that, that, it, that is true is future sort of civilizations on Earth, for example, three billion years from now, let's say, in principle would see a very different night sky than we see. So first of all, as Andromeda approached, it would look bigger in the sky. So, you know, two billion years from now, you can, see, you can see Andromeda just barely with a pair of binoculars, but two billion years from now, it'll probably be a significant amount, significant amount closer. And you can see it, and it'll be much bigger on the sky. So as it approaches, over the course of billions of years, it will look bigger and bigger on the sky. After the collision happens, the night sky will probably look completely different. It's possible that the problem, almost certain that the location of the sun from the center of this new galaxy will be a lot different. So it could be tossed out to a farther distance, or it could be at a near distance, the constellations will all change, all that kind of stuff will change. Um, but more generally, if you look out in the universe, you see lots and lots of examples of not just galaxies sitting there by themselves, but galaxies interacting with each other, emerging. And we now have this picture of the universe where it's actually a pretty violent place, where galaxies are colliding with each, with each other all the time, and this is shaping how galaxies play out and look over time. We also think that these mergers are happening a lot more rapidly as we look back in time in the universe. So if you look very, very far away and things very far away, you see a lot more instances of galaxies merging. 
and things are settling down a little bit over time. Okay, um, I think that's it. If there aren't any questions, I'll stop there.